As I call to you for help As I lift up my hands To your most holy place Hear my cry for mercy Do not drag me away With the wicked With those who do evil I lift my hands I had to start out muted just for a hog. So here you are. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Bill Donahue, or morning if you're in Hawaii with me. Bill Donahue with Discerning Truth, and thanks everybody for uh, coming. So, as has been my practice on Fridays, I try to do something different, but I always try to relate what we're doing to our study in Revelation. And it may be 
tangentially connected. It may have a direct connection, but uh, everything that I've looked at for more than a year will be used in that revelation study. And this is no different. I'm going to do our our first of what I expect to be numerous looks at Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the Daniel 70 week prophecy. Before we start, let me um, get some business out of the way. Yes, my address is in Hawaii. <coughs> Hopefully soon to be permanent over here, but I'm over here getting the house ready for the, my wife um, so she can join me and, and not live in dust and clutter, you know. And then uh, any cards and letters and anything you want to send me is better off sending it here. I'll be here more often than home. And uh, well, I don't know this is home. I'll be here more often than in California, right? And then uh, regular emails go to bill at discerningtruths.com. And anything for the Profit Club is going to go to ProfitClubClowns at gmail.com. And uh, I put a link to my replays up in the slides because I know that there's people coming for Revelation that weren't here for the, the groundwork that it took me a year to lay. And um, you're welcome to stay, and, and I appreciate you being here. But you may want to go back and start looking at some of the older uh, uh, studies to, to uh, understand how we developed or how I settled on a methodology rather than an interpretive grid and uh, to coming after the uh, or looking at the Bible and uh, at the end of my shows I try to make a PDF and put them up on telegram uh, channel on the discerning truth group I was notified yesterday that some of them are missing when I get back to my hard drive I will put up the missing uh, any missing episodes that are not there but uh, I try to keep them up there and they're for your study and you can, uh, you know, use them as you wish to uh, check me out, see if what I'm saying is true. Be like the Bereans, Acts 17, 11. Listen with openness of mind and then search the scripture daily to see if what I say is true. Do that with everyone you listen to and you'll be well served by it. <clears throat> so Monday and Wednesday I'm doing Revelation. Friday we do something different and Tuesday uh, Neil wasn't on this week but uh, on Tuesday but I believe we're going to be back on schedule for next week and I'll be joining Neil <laughs> even though uh, it's 5 30 a.m. here so <laughs> I need a cup of coffee for that one and then uh, we'll be up and that schedule will be back and then if you haven't been listening to Michael Beatty Miguel California on his uh, run through second Kings uh Boy, he has brought that that book. These books he's doing in the Old Testament, he brings them to life. He is a real gift for storytelling and uh, some gruesome stuff there in some of those chapters. And it was uh, wonderful. So just do that. And then on Sunday, his uh, lovely wife, Linda, Gammy Len to many of us, is uh, joins him and they're looking at Psalms. And, and it's, a, uh, it's a great little Sunday study. So with that, I'm going to get on to our study at large. And I put this up as a title screen because I don't know how many of you have read The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson, but I guarantee you a lot of the prophecy teachers, pastors, and, and people that you've listened to have either read him or, or based in a lot of their information off of things he wrote in uh, 1894. It is, uh, the book is full of errors. I mean, assumptions and errors and just mathematical mistakes, and it, it's uh, poor scholarship from start to finish. Uh, but 120 years, you'd think maybe some apologist or two might figure that out, but they haven't, and they keep using this stuff. Or they use the same data and come up with different dates for their exact day fulfillment of the um, prophecy. And we're going to deal with him a, a little bit in this... Uh, study but i thought the, the best thing to start out with is what does daniel actually say because if we're going to talk about a fulfillment of daniel we ought to be uh clear on what the passage says as opposed to what people have told us it says <clears throat> daniel the 70 week prophecies in daniel 9 24 to 27 and it, it gets its name from the start Seventy weeks are decreed ab about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, 
to atone for iniquity and to bring everlasting righteousness to seal up, seal both vision and the prophets and anoint the most holy place. You therefore, or know therefore, and, and understand that going from the going forth, going out to the world to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seventy seven weeks. Then it will be 62 weeks, and it will be built again in the squares and the moat, but in troubled times. And after that 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offerings. On the wings of abomination shall come those, uh, come the one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, there's a mouthful, a lot going on in those 70 weeks. Um, I would tell you this, that most people that interpret this passage hold that the portion in yellow after the 62 weeks, it's 62 plus the 7, making 69 the anointed one which is a way to say the messiah that's exactly what messiah means and uh shall be cut off and shall have nothing it's kind of um and so they put that is after 69 weeks you have the uh, crucifixion of jesus now how much longer after the 69 weeks that's for who to say but it's clearly 69 weeks has to pass and then the uh, um, crucifixion happens. But the first thing I want you to notice in this chapter, because this is gonna be used as the basis of a seven year tribulation. Anywhere in this passage say the tribulation is seven years long? Do you see that anywhere? No, it's based on the assumption that the last week of this prophecy is a seven-year period and that that seven-year period is wholly to be fulfilled under the antichrist but not all commentators in fact most commentators for the last 2000 years or probably 1800 of those years did not read that that way because when you get to the he the pronoun in verse 27 and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week who's the he refer to because in the previous verse it talks about the people of a prince he's a subordinate clause he's not even the subject of that um clause so does that he refer back to a prince that's part of a subordinate clause or does it refer back to the antecedent noun which is the messiah the anointed one and if it does refer to the anointed one he did make a covenant with, he enforced God's covenant with man for a week, right? But half the week, he, he, it'll, he put an end to sacrifice in an offering. He, he absolutely end, ended that. Uh, there's no more sacrifice or no, no need offering because of Jesus' death on the cruise. Well, if he has a three and a half year ministry, which a lot of people hold to that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, and at that point, he put an end to that. And then you have this pause there, and on the wings of abomination to come the one who makes desolate doesn't give you a time frame for the rest of that verse. Okay? So a lot of people have held that there's only three and a half years left in the 70-week prophecy for the abominations to be filled out because something Jesus did not do in his three-and-a-half-year ministry is he didn't seal up both vision and the prophets he didn't anoint the most holy place, right? He did um, finish the transgression. He put an end to sin. I mean, sin still exists in the world, so ultimately that maybe that's not even included. He did atone for iniquity, and uh, he brought his everlasting righteousness, but even that has a, a already but not yet um, feel. So the 70 weeks covers a lot of stuff that doesn't seem like it is going to be completed till the end of time right at the second coming of jesus so um this idea that this clearly teaches a seven-year tribulation 
that it's going to be broken in half by um, the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation and all that stuff. Those are all neat um, things that you will find in people's uh, grid for their end time vision. The problem you have is none of it's in this passage. Okay? They're based on this passage. This passage doesn't actually say what they say it says, right? You have to bring your interpretive grid into this passage, filter it through that grid, and then you can get all that information out of there. And, and so part of what I've been trying to do with you in our studies is to get us accustomed to setting our grids aside and, and let the Bible interpret itself. Maybe there is a seven year tribulation. Maybe it's not, maybe it's three and a half years. I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go through revelation, but it's not, what I'm saying is when they come in here and tell you, this is it. And, and they base it on it. And the other prophecy they use is a war in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where they burn the weapons of war for seven years. And they go, see, that war starts the tribulation. And then you do. What well, the problem you have is John is going to quote Ezekiel 38 and 39 in Revelations 19 and Re Revelation singular. I, I hate people to put an S on it. And I just did by accident. Uh, it's the Revelation singular of Jesus Christ, right? And, but John connects Ezekiel 38 and 39 to Revelations chapters 19 and 20, which are definitely not the beginning of the tribulation, right? So that kind of throws that theory uh, a little um, curveball in what they're, they're doing. But <clears throat> you can't listen to a prophecy teacher without having them refer to this prophecy. And a lot of them will use information produced by um, Sir Robert Anderson <coughs> in this book and claim that it was filled to the exact day. And I'm going to kind of go set you the groundwork on what exactly this exact day fulfillment claim is and how many of them there are. Actually, I'm not going to hit them all, okay, because we'd be here till next Tuesday, okay. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 2, 1 to 3, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. And now, and I had been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Um, then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not, not my face be sad when the city and the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and, the, and its graves are destroyed by fire? Now, this continues on through the whole chapter of, of Nehemiah 2. But what I highlighted in yellow is what I want to pick out. Uh, prophecy teachers, many of them, not all of them, think that this chapter describes an edict from King Artaxerxes to go rebuild the, um, the, the um, Jerusalem and the temple. And uh, they connect that to the Daniel passage and say that that was the start of the 70 week passage, right? And um, so what we're looking at is <clears throat> it gives us a time frame. It's the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So you go and, and go, when was the 20th year of King Artaxerxes? And you're going to see it listed as either 445 or 444 BC. And Anderson used information from a royal astronomer to pick his starting dates of March 14, 445 BC. But this is going to get more confusing because the Julian calendar, which most scholars used and the British astronomer was using, right? March 14, 445 BC would be March 9th, 444 BC on the Gregorian calendar. Whoa, what do, what do you mean? Yeah. And, and don't get confused by the 445 and 444 here. That's just different ways to reconcile the, the same year. Uh, and you'll see the same thing with Julian dates. But it's a, uh, and it, it, we're, we're talking about a nine day difference, not a year and nine days, right? You know? And, uh, but this is, this is where, where immediately you got Anderson given one date and he's treating it like a different date. And there's some good articles on this subject, subject and biblical archaeology um, 
their their articles are available online. I gave you a link to one of them, and I've included an excerpt below. And then uh, look at this from Isaiah. And I took the, the what's in red and yellow out of two sections of this article, and and they're picking out from Isaiah, and they've they've taken verses one, three, four, and thirteen, and and pieced them together. And it says, Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, who I have taken by the right hand for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one. I have called you by your name, and I have given you the title and honor, though you may not have known me. I have aroused in you righteousness, and I will make all his ways smooth. And he will build my city and will let my people, my exiles, go free without any payment or reward. Now, and then in yellow, it says, Hence, I believe we can uh, be confident based on the information derived above from the scriptures that the decree referred to in Daniel 9.25 had to be issued by Artaxerxes, Lodge and Monus, shortly before Ezra's departure to Jerusalem in the spring of 457 B.C. Well, wait a second. We're kind of all over the board here. We had a three-year span, 444 to 450, or, uh, not three-year. 13 year span right which date are we talking about and the isaiah prophecy sure makes it sounds like it was cyrus who set the decree and artaxerxes is just fulfilling a decree um made by by cyrus so when do you start your date and this is this is well this is going to get cra crazy you got cyrus darius and um artaxerxes and so did Cyrus make the, the decree that Daniel's talking to and Darius and Artaxerxes only fulfill that decree? Or is it the Artaxerxes uh, discussion in Nehemiah 2 that Daniel's referring, referring to? And those are huge assumptions when you make them. And I'm telling you, they make them. And, and they're making assumptions that are not necessarily um, based in scripture or history. And their dates are all over the board, okay? <clears throat> but even for a minute, if we're going to assume that Nehemiah chapter 2 does describe the edict of Daniel, uh, is referring to in Daniel 9.25, we still have to dispute whether this happened in 445 or, or uh, that, should, that should be 445, not 455. 445 or 444 B.C. My mistake, I'll fix it right now. Watch this, I can fix it on the fly. Thanks, boy. Let me play that. There you go. <laughs> fix that. Then along comes Dr. Howard Horner, okay? And he's questioned the starting and ending dates put forth by Anderson. Horner advocates a time of Artaxerxes' decree in 444 B.C., not 445 B.C., and Honor explains this. The date of this decree is given in the biblical record in Nehemiah 1.1, states that Nehemiah heard of Jerusalem's desolate condition in the month of Chislev, November or December, in Artaxerxes' 20th year. Then later, in Artaxerxes' 20th year, the month of Nisan, which is March or April, Nehemiah reports that he was granted permission to restore this uh, building and the walls. To have Nissan later than Chislev in the same year may seem strange to us to use like January, right? As our transition, January 1. But if you're using a Jewish cycle of Tishri to Tishri as their, as their year, then you realize that Nehemiah is using that date and following the Jewish method rather than the Persian method of Nisan to Nisan, uh, which is their religious year, and, he, and he's not using um, anything, that he's gone back to a Tishri to Tishri. And in doing that, the 20th year uh, puts you in, in uh, 444 BC and not 445 BC. And I don't want your eyes rolling back in your head and going, okay, you're like making me crazy with these dates, Bill, and, and whatever. What I want you to understand is that anybody, you listening to them on TV, the radio, anybody broadcasting, telling you that they know the exact date that this edict was given, they don't understand the subject. 
because there are too many scholars that have looked at this and come up with different dates just as the starting date. And I'm already taking a position that picking that starting date that Anderson did was like shooting your arrow and then going to paint the bullseye after and say you made a perfect hit. Okay? But Anderson's theory is pretty simple. He counts the 70 weeks prophecy as 70 times 7 for 7 days in a week or 490 years. Then he assumes that each day represents a year and, and concludes that the prophecy will be fulfilled in 490 years, right? But 69 weeks, right, is going to be fulfilled in um, 360 or what, 383. 483 years, not 490. One week short, 483 years, right? So what he does, and there's good evidence the Bible uses a 360-day uh, prophetic year. So let's just do this. He takes 69 times 7 for the week times 360 days, and he came up with 173,880 days. He believed Nehemiah 2, uh, was the edict in question. So he wanted to find out the day of the Jewish month of Nisan would have started in that year since Nehemiah 2 says it was Nisan, right? The royal astronomer in Britain gave him the date a new moon would have been visible, been, okay, visible on the Babylonian plain as March, uh, the 14th of March, 445 BC. The royal astronomer being a scholar used Julian dates. Okay, Anderson then added 173,880 days to that date and came to April 6, 32 AD. The only way you can do that is to erroneously treat these Julian dates as Gregorian dates. Well, I'm missing ends everywhere. Because there is a five-day difference in the calendars at your starting point and a two-day difference at your ending point, leaving a three-day net error in your calculation if you do this. Okay, well, actually, it's two days, but you come up with 173,882 days, but Anderson includes, insists in his arguments that you have to include both the starting and ending date in your account, which makes it 173,883, and he's claiming, he's counting the same days, same period I am, and he came up with 173,880. The only way you can do that is to not know the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. Now, the Gregorian calendar didn't exist back then. So these are retro-calculated Gregorian dates, right? <clears throat> and you're going to see that happening with all the calendars. If you use calendar conversions online, they all retro-calculate dates, okay? Now, had he done his math correcting, his ending date would have been the 3rd of April, 32 AD on the Julian calendar, or the 3rd of Nisan, 3792. The problem is, he needs them there on the triumphal entry for his theory, and he can't have the triumphal entry 11 days before the crucifixion, right? But even if we do his date of the 6th of Nisan, 37 AD, that's going to be Sunday. He hit Palm Sunday if he uses Julian dates, right? And and that's the date he sets for the triumphal entry. And he claims that's the date the 69 weeks ends. And I'm going to go back to slide five here for a minute to remind you what that passage actually says, right? And it says, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one should be cut off and have nothing, right? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Let's go back to verse 25. Know therefore and understand from the going out to the word to restore and build Jerusalem and the coming of an anointed one, a prince. Did Jesus come at his um, triumphal entry? Or did he come at his birth? Or did he come at his baptism? Or did he come, you know, when when is the coming of Jesus? Because there it seems almost arbitrary that we're picking the uh, his coming as the triumphal entry. He picked it because his numbers don't add up if he uses any other days. Even with his math error, he can't make them work, right? So, let's go back. 
So to finish the slide, Anderson needs this, but look at, he hits 32 AD. I want you to pay attention. Most scholars hold to either a 30 or 33 AD crucifixion, not 32 AD. Anderson's off, but you're gonna see people quote him and use his data and claim an exact day fulfillment for a crucifixion in either of those years, 30 or 33 AD. And, but his math works in 32 AD if you give them a three-day error. If you go, okay, you just messed up three days, your exact day fulfillment's only three days wrong if we were in the, um, 32 AD. Now, Anderson's rationale for the triumphal entry as ending date from Daniel 9.25 is, is there, you know? But he assumed the coming of the anointed one didn't refer to his birth or his start of his ministry, but rather than Jesus presenting himself as a Messiah during a triumphal entry. You can make that argument. I'm not saying he's totally wrong, but it, it just seems arbitrary to me. And are you starting to notice a pattern of assumptions here? Harold Honer used a similar methodology of Anderson, but after he believed he corrected Anderson's dates, he has the 69 weeks end at the crucifixion on the 3rd of April, 33 AD. Well, you can't have the triumphal entry in 32 AD and the crucifixion in 33 AD, right? What Honer said is Anderson dates are all wrong, but I'm gonna use the same methodology and I'm gonna come up to April 3rd, 33 AD. And he comes up with the Friday crucifixion, which is popular and a lot of people hold to that position. And he's there. But along came a guy named Jay Finnegan in the handbook of Bible chronology, right? And after pointing out numerous errors and assumptions they are making with the Jewish calendar, right? which is a problem because they're messing with the Jewish calendar without both of them are making errors in that, that according to Finnegan, the actual dates between when Nissan would have started and their dates is 773,855. We got a 25 day discrepancy here. Okay. Now, Anderson arbitrarily picked the first of Nissan as a starting date. It, it, the decree could have come out in the 25th of Nissan. You could make up those 25 days easily. And that's what Finnegan uh, does. And, but his calculations end at the start of Jesus's ministry, which he dates at 27 AD and his death at 30. So he doesn't end at the triumphal entry. He doesn't end at the crucifixion. He ends at the start of his ministry. But in 27 AD, do you understand? These are all claims of exact day fulfillment that you got going on here by people using the same prophecy and reading into that prophecy something that doesn't actually say. Okay. <clears throat> now the other problem, what, what Finnegan explained and what you probably never hear anybody else tell you the modern Jewish calendar is based on what's called the Metonic cycle. It's a period of 19 calendar years, 235 lunar months, after which the new moons um, and the full moon return to the same um, place or nearly the same dates as the, as the original year. So they're off by minutes, not by, by days or a week, right? The Metonic cycle was discovered by Greek astronomer Menton in 435 BC but some say sources that Jews gradually shifted to the Metonic cycle between 200 and 500 AD, right? However, a fixed astronomically calculated Jewish calendar, there's no record of it beginning to be replaced the observational calendar until Rabbi Hillel II in 358 to 363 AD. That's the first record in Jewish records that they started using this. If they didn't use it prior to 358 AD, how can you say what month it was or what day of the month it was in 444 BC? Following what where the problem is? Now, there, there were reforms, we're limited to the 19 year cycle where the complete set of rules finally adopted at 1000 AD, okay? The Talmud in the 4th to 5th century AD reportedly contains no trace of Hillel's calendar. So even the Talmud, which was created in, in 4 to 500 AD, 
is has no record of this them using this calendar okay the problem is that the original Jewish calendar was observational meaning that a month started after a new moon was seen okay had to be observed and it actually has to be observed by two people if you have overcast skies or whatever and the moon's not visible your month don't start you just hold off starting a month okay and the um they had a uh, observation for the um, spring equinox to keep your seasons from going whack totally out of whack if you got a 354 day lunar or solar lunar calendar and a 365 uh, day solar calendar it doesn't take very many lunar years until your harvesting season doesn't take place during harvest time and you know your your feast will all be off whack so the the priests were in charge of ensuring that the spring equinox had occurred before the month of Nisan was to start. If the spring equinox had advanced far enough to where the month of Nisan had not, um, was not ready to start, or Nisan was starting before that happened. Boy, I'm tongue tied today, I'm sorry. But if the month of Nisan was gonna start before the spring equinox, they added in a second month called the second Adar. And they just had a 13 month year instead of a 12 month year. And that's how they shifted the calendar back. Prior to 500 AD, we have no idea when those second eight or months were added and how often, and it's impossible for anybody to state that prior to 500 AD on this date on your Julian calendar is that date on a Hebrew calendar. Now I know we have, um, online calculators that you can go online and punch in dates and i've done it right and you can get proof that there this is what date it was and and passover happened on this date and uh, crucifixion happened on on friday because it was in this year we can't prove it none of that is provable and and that's the problem people start making exact day claims of fulfillment of passages based on information, one, the pastor doesn't even claim to be stating, and based on information that is easily disprovable as not being true. And that gets to be a problem, right? So let me come back and chat with you guys for just a minute. <coughs> so it's, uh, it's crazy. And I've talked to you before, but there's dates for the crucifixion of Jesus that range from generally about 27 AD to 33 uh, AD some go out as much to about 36 AD okay his birth ranges from 5 to 6 BC to um, 1 AD okay I favor one over another right I think I think Jesus was born in the fall of 2 BC and was crucified in 33 AD a lot of scholars hold to a uh, 5 BC and 30 AD um, um, program. And because there's only a few months left in that 5 BC range, and it was only a few months into the 30 AD, then he's only 33 and a half, right? So just understand, scholars have looked at this, and they're all over the place. And what you want to be careful of is... It, it should be a red flag for you. If somebody tells you they have this all worked out and they have their chart and their little scheme and, and their end time scenarios all laid out for you and it's in perfectly neat little orderly fashion, they haven't done the study. They don't understand the subject. And I'd say flat out, I mean, I'm not, I'm running mince meat. They do not know what they're talking about because scholars admit of the problems they have and then tell you where they landed, why they landed on a on a specific answer, right? And uh, so this is um, this is problematic. It's just you see people cheat in in non Christian subjects and and fudge the facts and and they're they're doing it in science or they're doing it in history or some other subjects. It doesn't bother me as much. I I have higher expectations for Christians to at least be honest. We don't need to overstate our bounds. 
I tell you about problems in, in the in the scripture differences between the Septuagint and Masoretic. I do that. I do that while telling you that I hundred percent believe the Bible. Okay, that I believe scripture was God breathed, that it's God inspired, that I don't have to make these extraordinary claims about scripture or extraordinary claims about prophecy for them to be true. The the truth is the simple truth is that. God became flesh, dwelt among us, and died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's the most incredible story known to man. And that's verifiable. I don't need to fabricate stuff to make my little prophecy scream, scheme come true. Right? So, if you give me a minute, I'm going to put on another song. And then I will, uh, I will come back and... Uh, <coughs> Read the, uh, I'll read the chat and see what's going on. Since I played Gracie earlier, I think I'll do it again, and we'll, we'll just make a Gracie day for my music selection. Yeah, so I, I seen the from praying headache the um, comment about Harold Camping and he wrote books all his life and, and kept changed the date of the year and the, and the last day. There are so many people that have done that. My favorite is Edgar Wyson, not I think that's how you pronounce his name. He wrote a book and uh, published it, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Would Happen in 1988. When rapture didn't happen, he submitted a new book to the publisher and he wanted to title it 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 89. They actually changed the title of the book. It, you know, like, I think it was called like the, uh, the Evidence Revisited or, or something. I, I can't recall the name of his book. But it was What Chutzpah to Be Dead Wrong and it just change, put your same information back out there and change the date. And this happens. I, there are so many people out there, prophecy teachers, one after another, that either parrot each other. I seen a comment in uh, from Roberto and about that a lot of these people are just regurgitating uh, Anderson's information without actually reading Anderson or understanding that his information's um, a year out of a hundred years out of date and has been disproven multiple times. Okay, uh, and that's true. It, it's like this parrot mode. You you go to seminary. They teach you something, you go back and you get a job as a pastor or an elder in a church, and that's what you teach is what they taught you, right? 
they ne there's not the idea that you should be critically thinking, questioning, and asking, is, is that, you know, where are you getting that out of this passage? How did you, how did you come up with that interpretation of what Daniel said? You know, why, when I look at commentators for 1800 years, they don't see the he in that Daniel 927 as referring to anybody but Jesus. But now you tell me the he refers to the Antichrist and therefore we have a seven year tribulation that's gonna be divided in the middle when in the, you go, wait a second, for 1800 years, every Christian mind, the greatest Christian minds of all times read that passage and they had a different conclusion than modern prophecy teachers why are they right and the, and the older scholars are wrong? And, and this is what I want you to ask. I want you to come into this thing, setting our, our presuppositions aside and just say, what does scripture actually say, right? And I'm not saying, I'm not questioning what God says. That's the devil's job. He said, did God really say? That was his lie in the garden, right? I'm not questioning what scripture says. I'm questioning their interpretation of scripture. See the difference? I believe scripture and I believe it says what it says and means what it says. I do not believe that everybody that sets themselves out as a prophecy teacher or a teacher of the Bible at all knows what the hell they're talking about. And a lot of them don't. And now we have this phenomenon since the, uh, the end of the Q post where people that used to be Q experts are now theology experts and are out there teaching on theology on their streams because they're trying to have something to give to their, their client. I mean, talk about the blind leading the blind. You don't see me breaking down Q posts because it's not my expertise. I know what I'm talking about here. I've done the study. I did the legwork to be able to come out and do a stream on this stuff. That's why I do it. But I have people who think that it's well within their uh, ability with no education in scripture, no education in history, church history, theology, hermeneutics, none, absolutely no study in those subjects that can come out and teach on this. I even have people who are like pastors. My former, my most recent pastor, one of our biggest issues towards the end before I left was at his insistence that he could teach revelation. I said, you haven't done the legwork with the congregation. You have to go set the leg, the groundwork in the Old Testament. They won't understand it. And I don't think you understand revelation to teach it, but he was hell bent on teaching it anyway, because I don't, well, I don't know. I can't judge a man's um, uh, motivation, but teaching on revelation brings in, in people. Everybody wants to know what's coming. We, we're all the same. We want to know what's there. And if there's an explanation of what's coming in the Bible, I want to hear it, right? So it brings in audience numbers. It brings in revenue. And that's why people glom to it. And, and, and you have people that don't know what the hell they're talking about teaching it. And, and most of them, because they won't do the study, are doing exactly what Roberta said, and they're just parroting something they heard without ever actually going back and looking at the source. That's why I put up the source in Daniel and asked you, read it yourself. Does it say any of the things you've been told it says? Because I'm claiming it doesn't. And then uh, I'm saying that uh, Bible scholars for 1800 years read that same passage and didn't see it to, to mean what people, modern prophecy teachers claim it means today. Some of the greatest minds in Christian thought looked at it and said no. So that's why yeah, we're looking around for fresh eyes. We're just trying to get fresh eyes on scripture and you let scripture interpret scripture. That's why I stick with a methodology rather than a grid. Because if my methodology comes across a passage that doesn't fit my particular interpretive plan or what I think is going to work out, my plan needs adjustment, not the scripture. I don't get the waterboard the scripture and make it say what I want, right? You know? You get to do that, and that's that's where we're at. So I'm hoping this is beneficial, and and it, I see a lot of people that tune in and, and have stuck with me for the last year, and I, I I'm glad that you think it's worth your time, and uh, God willing, I'll be back here Monday and uh, teaching on Revelation again, and uh, 
don't forget uh, Michael and Linda on Sunday morning. And uh, with that, I'm going to get out of here. And may God bless you all, right? So, the outro.